Well, tonight we continue with our Easter season series on heaven with this talk on what will the resurrected earth be like? Our purpose continues to be on teaching about heaven as revealed in scripture in such a way that you can easily communicate heaven to those in your life who think this earthly layover is all there is. So I want to say how thankful I am that you all returned to hear more about what our Bible reveals of our new heaven and our new earth, because in my experience, both heaven and hell are either ignored, ridiculed, or denied by the world today. Many have allowed fictional books, TV shows, and even movies to shape their understanding of these places. Now, years ago, I worked in an office where on the wall of our conference room was a quote, and it read, slide two, life's good experiences are heaven, and it's bad times hell. And I have to tell you that although that's Bible-denying philosophy, there's some very potential truth in that saying, because, slide three, this world is indeed the only hell the believer will ever experience, and the only heaven the unbeliever will ever know. See, as believers, we know that scripture tells us that there's a new heaven and a new earth, and all that will be ushered in when Christ returns. That the intermediate heaven that Al talked about last week, that paradise, as Jesus referred to when speaking to the thief on the cross, that place where our loved ones in Christ who have died are now, that heaven will change when Christ returns. So tonight, I want you to follow along with me with the slides as we open our Bibles and really dig into God's word. Beginning with, where is all this talk of a new heaven and a new earth coming from? Well, the primary verses that refer to this are, Isaiah's recording of God's promise in the Old Testament of God saying of the end time, I create new heavens and a new earth. And again, when revealing his final judgment of humanity, the Lord telling us that the new heavens and the new earth will remain before him, meaning that they'll be everlasting. Also, the Apostle Peter reaffirming God's promise that we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which the righteous will dwell. And with Jesus revealing this to John in Revelation 21, John seeing a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And of course, you caught the plural use of heavens. Slide six. You see, our understanding of how many heavens there are, it begins in the creation story. In the very first verse of our Bible, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And this specific use of the plural of heaven is again used when creation is completed. The heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, referring to the angels, the stars, and the planets, and on earth, the multitudes of living creatures, creatures on the land, in the seas, and in the air. You see, it's important for us to understand these heavens, as all, all three are transformed when we get to that part in our teaching tonight, of what will the new heaven and the new earth be like? Because the word of God reveals all creation will be redeemed, restored, resurrected, transformed, changed. Slide seven. All of it changed, restored, transformed, resurrected. These three heavens as recognized by the Christian church and on this slide, I pulled a couple of verses under each, although there are others that point to there being three heavens. The first heaven is the earth's atmosphere. 
the immediate sky. It's where the birds and clouds are. And these two scriptures refers to the rains coming from this heaven. And the second heaven is outer space. It's where the sun, moon, stars, and planets are. And the third, as talked about last week, this third heaven is the intermediate dwelling place of God and of all the good angels and of all the saints who have gone before us. And Paul refers to the third heaven as paradise. Paul speaking of himself saying, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. And he says, this man was caught up into paradise. This third heaven and the other two, they'll all change as scripture tells us, slide nine, that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. But to understand what this will look like, we need to look into the nature of Jesus's resurrection because it's the character of his bodily resurrection that points to the cosmic transformation found in God's purpose to redeem the natural order through the victory of Christ, to redeem humanity and all creation even better than before the fall of Adam. Like all of humanity, creation was distorted by original sin. The natural order as we know it, now subject to decay and death. Because of sin, humanity and all creation fell. And as my grandmother would say, it's a fallen world. The neighbor's dog is in my roses and all I do is cook and clean. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And she's right. It's not the way it's supposed to be. You see, in the garden that we lost, and even better in the new heaven and the new earth, even Joe Exotic could never accuse Carol Baskin of feeding her husband to tigers. We live in a fallen world, and God's plan to redeem us, his plan to redeem all creation is seen and it's all caught up in Jesus. The truth is that the whole physical universe is caught up into Jesus's resurrection and now waits for his return for full consummation. Consummation being the ultimate goal, the final state of this new heaven and new earth. The apostle Paul speaks of this in Romans 8. Romans 8 starting with verse 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. See here, Paul is referring to the manifestation of all believers in their resurrection, in their resurrected change bodies that happens when Jesus returns. He continues, for the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, not because of him who subjected it. This being the curse given by God in the Garden of Eden that subjected the creation to suffer. The curse given by God in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 through 19, when God said to Adam, because you have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat, Cursed is the ground because of you. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. So all creation is in hope, continuing with verse 21, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from this bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. To be free with a glorified existence with the believers. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Until now being that time of Jesus Christ's redeeming work that all creation benefits from. Verse 23, not only the creation, but we ourselves, we all believers, for all believers, have the first fruits of the Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit that indwells within us, the Holy Spirit who gives us a sample of the life to come, a taste of the love of God, a glimpse of the glory of Christ, a beginning of the new life that will be ours forever. That taste, that glimpse, that promise of all that is to come is what we groom inwardly for, as in, come, Lord Jesus, come, as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons and daughters, the redemption of our bodies. See, the point that Paul is making is that not only are we waiting for our perfect and glorified bodies, so is all of creation waiting to be free of its curse and restored a return to how it was before the sin in the Garden of Eden, and even better. But before we go into what that looks like, I want to touch once again and go a little deeper on Jesus' return and how this new heaven and new earth are ushered in. Slide 13. See, his return is so very clear in Scripture, but it's the details of when and how it all unfolds that are often debated. In Christianity, and especially as Anglicans, we use the word adiaphora to refer to those details not regarded as essential to faith, but nevertheless as permissible for Christians or allowed in the church. As Al mentioned last week, and as Bishop John Rogers reminds us, Anglicans have never taken an official position regarding any particular detailed end time schema. We, we haven't. There's no definite position regarding the doctrine of the millennium or the Lord's 1,000 year reign, because it's subject to various interpretations of the book of Revelation. But please understand this, that in no way does that mean that we're lacking in our understanding of eschatology. Eschatology being that part of theology concerned with death, judgment, and the final destiny of the soul and of all humanity. In fact, it would be accurate to say that Anglicans are instructed on the four final events of the end time. They are the second coming of Christ, the general resurrection of the dead, the final judgment of humanity, and the final states of heaven and hell. So I'm moving us to that point of the final state where we find our resurrected earth. And it's the movement through these final events, which, well, it's, it's where the details are so often debated among believers and where we come to find those three main end time views. Slide 16. Last week, we touched a little on these main views of pre- post, and amillennialism, and what gets fuzzy is how we tie Jesus' return into his millennial reign. For the premillennialists, Christ will come in a pre-showing, before the millennium period and before the tribulation, to extract his church, the rapture of believers as depicted in the left-behind novels of Tim LaHaye. With the post millennialist the gospel will spread to bring peace throughout the world. And after a thousand years of peace, Christ will come again. And for the ah millennial, boy, that, that's a tough word for me. And for the ah millennialist the thousand year reign is a symbolic number. Ah, I'm going to start all 